Good morning. It's so good to be with you. My name is Paul Weaver and it's my joy today on this Good Friday to bring you the devotion. Paul in Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 to 11 crystallizes the life, the death, the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ in just five verses. The Bible has this amazing ability to reduce major events into a few short sentences. The object of this passage is not just to have an admiration parade for Jesus Christ, although of course he is most worthy, but to give us an example in life for us to follow. Good Friday is the climax of Christ's life on earth. It is the purpose for which Christ came into the world. And of course, salvation cannot be achieved just by someone dying on a cross. Lots of people were crucified years ago. For salvation to be established, the person's life must be exemplary, sinless and resurrected. This passage is telling us that you cannot have the throne without the cross. Of course, we all want to avoid the crosses of life. We search for the blessings, not the hardships. And it is because of this that our understanding and concept of Christian living is often watered down or even distorted. Paul gives us four secrets to living the Christian life in verse 1, and each one are prefixed with the word if. If you have any encouragement for being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion. This word if is not here just as a condition, but rather as an understanding about our communion with God and how it works in life. In other words, Paul is showing us that our vertical standing with God holds the key to our horizontal relationships. Communion with God enables us to be equipped for the challenges of life. Relationship begets relationship. Our relationship with Christ calls us in verse 2 to 4 to be like-minded, having the same love being in one spirit and purpose, not motivated by self-ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, considering each other better than yourself, looking not for your own interests only, but also the interests of others. Wouldn't you love to belong to a church like that? But how can this be, you might ask? Paul explains how by highlighting the importance of us understanding the mind of Christ. He says in verse 5, let this mind, the word their mind is this attitude, be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 2.16, Paul amplifies on that and makes a remarkable statement. He says, we have the mind of Christ. Literally, it means the faculty of Christ's thinking. We don't know everything, of course, but we can think like Christ. How did Christ face and conquer the journey of his life? Simply by having a submissive mind to the Father. He was preparing himself all through his life for the cross. So preparation for the cross. Paul gives us this picture of the prepared life in verses 5 to 8. See, preparation for the cross for Christ requires an understanding of his position. And that's so with us. What do you do with your position in life? We all have different positions in life. The human drive strives for higher position, but Christian living operates on a completely different level. Let's look at verse 6 to 8. Christ Jesus was being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant or adding to that's what it means there uh, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself so let's just look at that so Jesus takes his position and he steps down when others want to step up Jesus humbles himself when others want to promote themselves. Jesus removes his crown when others were hanging on to their crowns. Jesus became what he was not 
to become what we couldn't become on our own. So the great question is this, have you positioned yourself to resemble Christ? The second thing you see there in the preparation for the cross was it required an understanding of obedience. Obedience is not selective when you choose what you like or only obey what you want to obey. True obedience concentrates on what God wants for you and focuses on the present and the future and therefore upon joy and suffering. And both of these are in this passage. Joy in obedience. It says in verse 8, he became obedient. The word for obedience here means to delight in constantly obeying. Isn't that a tra challenge to us this morning? To enjoy our obedience to God. This form of obedience, of course, is a joy and not a burden to Christ. Paul's exp uh, uh, expectation for the church at Philippi was joyous obedience. An obedient church is a happy church. Future joy was a means of stimulating uh, uh, obedience in Christ too. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says these words, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. When we are truly obedient to God, we know joy. And then, of course, in this passage, it's not only obedience linked to joy, which we probably all want, but also obedience is linked to suffering. And he says in verse 8, even death on a cross. Jesus put no limits on his obedience to his Father. Our obedience is challenged most in the context of suffering and temptation. Paul is reminding the church at Philippi, you can go through the suffering barrier and you can even go through death's door if you are drawing on the divine supply. This Good Friday is, not, is about looking back on the life of Jesus as he prepares himself for suffering and death on the cross. He succeeded, but how are you getting on? in the difficulty that you may be facing, the suffering that you may be going through this morning. The Christian answer is sometimes a dichotomy of experience, joy and suffering. How do we handle these extremes? Well, the answer is obedience. For every trial, God has a provision. And obedience is the release button, if you like, to that provision. Jesus called us to take up our cross and follow him, to deny ourselves. And when you do that, you choose the way of obedience and suffering. You may not have all the answers or an answer at all in the trial you are in today. But by faith, you will not give up. I'm so glad that this passage of scripture does not stop at the cross, but proceeds through resurrection and ascension to eternal honor. And therefore, we have this idea of destined for the throne. This passage of scripture represents us with or presents us with an interesting question. What can God exalt? And destiny, therefore, is in our hands as well as God's hands. Our hands, the place where we make life's choices. Do we follow Christ's example? Do we live in God's provisions? Do we trust when we cannot trace his hand? And then God's hands, the place where our position in God is now defined. We are the children of the living God and our heavenly position is determined. And that's why Paul uses the word, therefore God, when talking about Jesus. When we find the word therefore, as many of you will know in the Bible, we ask the question, what is it there for? It is there to show connection. The preparation for the cross becomes the basis upon which God can exalt Jesus Christ. The cross and the throne are connected. God, after the death of his son, steps in to do what the son is waiting for in that cold, damp uh, tomb. What does God do for Jesus? 
Well, it's all there in this passage. He raises him to life, vindicating the authenticity of Christ's work on the cross. He exalts him to the highest place. The greatest work deserves the highest place. He gives him a name above all other names. He makes every need to bow down and confess, and every tongue conf confess his lordship. And then all of this is for the glory of God. We would all like honor, promotion, position, but there is a road to such privilege. Jesus put it like this. He that is greatest among you, you shall be your servant. And whoever will, will exalt himself shall be abased, and that humbles himself shall be exalted. Paul says to the church at Philippi and to us here today, bring your mind, bring your attitude into alignment with God the Father. Follow the example of Jesus Christ. If you can face the crosses of life, then your heavenly Father will deal with the promotions. 2,000 years ago, our Saviour Jesus Christ endured the pain of the cross so that we could enjoy the glory of heaven. Paul understood this clearly, and that's why he follows in the footprints of Jesus Christ. He said in Romans 8, 18, for I reckon or I calculate, it's a mathematical word in the Greek there. He says, I have worked out that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. So, my friends, this morning, as you contemplate Good Friday, just remember Jesus prepared for the cross, but he was destined for the throne. Let this mind be in you today. May God bless you, encourage you, and bring you through so that your life glorifies the Father too. God bless you.